lot of legacy still exists in the core banking um, um, infrastructures of these banks. But we're working with a lot of the uh, more modern, uh, more cloud native um, core banking providers um, to deliver, you know, fully tested and certified platforms that a lot of these customers are looking at and some are even testing. Hmm. Where we see that working really, really well is in a business like Starlink. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we can put satellites into orbit and all of a sudden they can start serving mobile traffic wherever they need to be. How does that network scale so quickly? We have, in partnership with IBM, open sourced uh, an AR project to the world uh, called Instruct Lab. Good day, I'm Matthew Burbage, and uh, the, uh, the today with Bruce Bosansky, the Red Hat Application Platform Specialist. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, Matthew. Thanks for having me. What do you get up to? What, what is an Application Platform Specialist? Good question, Matthew. Um, so, I- in essence, uh, my role is to work with our customers, uh, largely in the um, financial services and telco space. Um working with them to uh, identify and and operationalize the best platforms to run their business applications on. Um, one of our goals at Red Hat is to uh, almost free them from the confines of one place. So typically, uh, I, I, I talk to them about building, you know, wherever they need to build it, sometimes in the cloud, sometimes at the edge, sometimes on-prem. Um, and it's become a, a really interesting topic. So that's kind of what I do every day. I talk to a lot of customers um, and help them run big projects to uh, to build business applications. So, I mean, if the last couple of years have taught us anything, it's that um, there is a kind of hybrid approach to things. Um, is, is that what you're seeing? Is that a kind of de-risking strategy that people are following? Absolutely. Uh, de-risking, good, good point about it. Um, I, I, I'd almost say... Uh, we watched how it happened in the in the earlier 2010s and saw everybody jumping to the cloud. Um, and really, our goal was was not to set any limits. Some of our customers do run exclusively in the cloud, but the whole hybrid approach uh, was certainly not developed by Red Hat. But I think we operationalized it to a point where our customers have the choice to run wherever they need to run. Um, and also, that one decision doesn't last a lifetime. So you know, if things need to move based on locality or customers. Um, or even costs, um, they're always able to to, to do that and, and free to move things around. So we've put hybrid into action, and and I've loved seeing how it's how it's been benefited our customers. Yeah, I mean you hear, I mean you hear you you, you hear I, I hear often that people um, are sometimes reluctant to go all in for with public cloud. Um, certainly among our public sector people um, and they talk to me about things like sovereignty and uh, and privacy but I suppose that's just a kind of maturity uh, curve that they're on. Absolutely and I mean any public sector I think that we work with around the world is always slightly behind in the modernization journey just by the nature of their business Yeah. Um, and, and this has rung true for a long time I think now the hyperscalers Really offer some great services locally, um, and and actually a lot of those challenges or concerns, um, you know, are, are no longer as relevant. I never want to say that they're not relevant. Um, our goal is 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 to partner with these businesses and make sure that when they're ready to move uh, and run exclusively in one place, whichever it might be, um, that they don't have to worry about those things like sovereignty and uh, uh, and compliance and policy. So, um, <clears throat> so what 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 are your customers wrestling with? So it, it's it's different, I guess, depending on the on the verticals that we look at. Um, specifically, if if we look at sort of our our financial customers, um, a lot of them are looking at uh, at, at modernization. Um, it's a journey that they've been on for some time, um, but I guess. Uh, you know, now that we're, we're we're getting to the mature part, um, they are, you know, as you've just said, grappling with what do we run in the cloud, what do we keep on prem, what makes the best sense for our business, what do we change now, um, and 
and and it's it's definitely not a one size fits all in the financial market. Um, we've been lucky as Red Hat that, uh, and you know, as we said earlier, we don't really tie ourselves to any one platform or tie our customers there. Um, so they have a lot of these opportunities, but ultimately, uh, it's about the business deciding where it, it, you know, it runs best for its customers. Um, for our telco customers, um, I think a lot of them are, are, are grappling with scale. Mm. Um, they've built great networks, but the infrastructure back at home and, and you know back in data center um, and some in cloud has scaled to a point that, that, that I think was never really thought about, but 5G pushed them to a completely new place. Um, so now a lot of them are grappling with, you know, how do we scale and scale fast? Because as we bring on more services, we need more infrastructure than we ever did before. Um, in our public sector customers, I, I'd, I'd say, as we mentioned just now, um, it, it, is a, it is a tougher modernization journey, especially here in South Africa. Um, I just, uh, uh, you know, I, I think they have older systems and mm. older systems require more care and cost more money. Mm. Um, and there are some, some migration efforts and some modernization efforts underway. Um, but it is certainly a, a more complex process than, than, than I think a lot of us uh, expected it to be. So, I mean, just, you, you know, I, the, the, the financial services people tell me that, um, you know, they maybe have these heritage systems that are that they can't switch off. Um, and so, well, at least the 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 kind of the traditional banks, so not your neo banks or challenger banks, which are have, to my mind, some advantages um, because they can just they can just be modern from the day one. Yep. Um, but how would they? How how I don't know if you could use kind of just like a general example of how how they would go about modernizing their systems specific specifically in financial services sure uh, and and not being a a, a sort of a, a definite financial services expert um i can tell you what i've seen and and uh, what we sort of looked at working with our customers in the field um you know always uh you know the the, the legacy is the thing that that makes our customers money it's the thing that they can't switch off and yeah. the thing that they have to love and care for um, it's the pet, I guess, in and amongst all the the cattle, um, and and that's okay. You know, we we want to make sure that 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 system, that platform, can survive. You know, as long as it needs to, in the safest possible way. Where we've had a lot of, uh, I guess, success with our financial services customers is in helping them modernize uh, and and almost decentralize a lot of the supporting systems around the core banking platforms. Um, so that is, you know, things like how internet banking scales um, and making use of cloud native and cloud type uh, approaches to building these applications so that they can if effectively scale out those kinds of applications very quickly. For some more of the, of, I guess, of, of the core systems like core banking um, and payments, um, a, 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 a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of legacy still exists in the core banking um, um infrastructures of these banks but we're working with a lot of the uh more modern uh more cloud native uh, core banking providers um to deliver you know fully tested and certified platforms that a lot of these customers are looking at and some are even testing hmm. um so it gets to a point where you know a platform has done its job and just can't live on anymore um so we're working with a lot of them to uh, start looking at and testing the newer platforms those that are more uh, decentralized and, and distributed and more cloud native. Um, at the same time, helping them build out the platforms on the supporting services so that when it is time to go, that they have, uh, I guess, a fully supported and understood uh, cloud native platform to run both the supporting apps and things like core, bank, core banking and payments as well. So, so you'd be using, how would they, how would they be using uh, RHEL? So that's Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Okay, so Red Enterprise Linux, or what we know and love, uh, you know, it, it, it's been the thing that that really created and put Red on the map, uh, I guess, and made us the most successful enterprise open source business for the last 30 years. Um, RHEL has been our, uh, I, you know, I, I guess our, 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 our staple that a lot of our customers, in fact, 
most of the the, the world uh, the world businesses paying for Linux. Seventy five percent of them are, are are buying real enterprise Linux. So uh, for a lot of what they've come to know and love about RHEL has has really moved through the ages. What we what we take care to deliver to them now is is the same trusted platform, but with a whole lot of new functionality. Um, and some of that new functionality is, uh, in, you know, supporting them to start adopting things like containers and Kubernetes. Um, you know, also to look at things like uh, security and cybersecurity is getting so stringent that, um, you know, there, there there isn't even time to patch things anymore. So, uh, you know, building in systems that can preempt um, you know these kinds of attacks and support patching them as soon as possible. Um, we use uh, a sort of um, not even sort of we we use a, a cloud hosted AI service um, that we've been building for many years um, that can help us identify and our customers security risks before you know they they've done too much damage. What's that called? Uh, it's called Reddit Insights. Okay. Um, and most importantly, can offer an automated way of remediating the problem. So it uses our automation platform. Um, it delivers a, effectively a nice automation script um, that the customer can change a couple of, of, of uh, figures and numbers on um, and run it and, and effectively patch out the environment very quickly. Um, the, I guess the, the, the last thing and probably one of the most interesting things about RHEL as a platform um, is that it has become, you know, a Linux platform. It was just an OS. But now, you know, what we're enabling our customers to do is, is start to adopt the more modern cloud-native ways of doing things, um, all based on the Linux that we create. So everything in Reddit starts with RHEL. Um, and now we're adding AI capabilities on top of RHEL um, in, a, in a new platform called RHEL AI. Okay, we're going to get to the AI piece in a bit. But just talk okay. a bit about OpenShift and how that fits into the RHEL um as platform happily so I, I guess the way that 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 red hat is is structured today is is roughly around three major platforms um the first of which is rel and we've just spoken a little bit about that um but openshift uh has been our uh cloud native kubernetes platform um that we've had uh in production since 2012 but really got its legs in in 2015 um when google uh, had open sourced and given kubernetes to the world um, what we wanted to do back in 2015 was deliver an enterprise Kubernetes platform, um, which not a lot of vendors were doing. Most important thing, though, about Kubernetes is it runs containers, and containers are based on Linux. So as I said earlier, if 75% of the world are paying for our Linux, then surely they would want to have it inside of their containers too. Yeah. So OpenShift gains incredible traction uh, quite early on between 2015, I'd say, and 2017, as the market leading enterprise Kubernetes platform, for such reasons as um, OpenShift was was a was an enterprise Kubernetes platform, but also that everything was based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Today, what we find is is OpenShift really has morphed for us uh, and and for our customers into a completely new thing. As we started out almost ten years ago with a uh, um, with an enterprise Kubernetes platform that was good for containerization. Today, we're looking at a, a, a complete end-to-end -end application platform to run any kind of business application from traditional virtualization all the way through to AI and edge workloads, but also in any place that our customers need to run it. So it is truly the thing that agnosticizes um, computing for, for so many of our customers um, and makes developers very happy because there's a lot less work. So we see... Oh, sorry, almost there. So we see OpenShift... Uh, um, really becoming, uh, I, I, I want to even call it the application operating system of the future. Um, it's already here now, but it will run any kind of application in any place that it needs to run, um, all with a consistent um, uh, set of, of, of operational rules um, that we can apply anywhere. So one would imagine that the financial services and the telcos are making use of Kubernetes. They, they're further along the line than on, on the journey than others. Absolutely. Uh, it was definitely for financial services first, um, just because I, I, I think there are so many more moving parts in a financial service org than it's inside of a telco. Um, but the telco had a, a, a different use case. They need absolute scale. Yeah. Um, and Kubernetes is, is, is able to orchestrate so many more things than we can uh, when things are just virtualized. 
Um, so it, it, it really has built on awesome scale. So when you talk about scale in, in, a, in a telco context, I mean, mm-hmm. would you, like, would it be the number of calls on the network? Or I mean, this is slightly above my pay grade, but, um, you know, how, how would, 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 would a call to spawn a container would be in the billing function or how would that, what would be the use case in the telco? Case? Sure. So, so within telco, um, I guess a- around the same time, mid 2010s, uh, this concept came out of network function virtualization, mm-hmm. which was effectively taking the physical devices and, and aspects of the network and virtualizing. virtualizing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for that, we needed a, a, an orchestrator to virtualize these things. Once we put them into software, though, uh, th- th- we were, the telcos were able to do so many more things because they weren't constrained by physical firewalls or physical boxes yeah. or physical anything. So standing up new sites, building larger radio access networks, building larger core networks, because software is much easier to scale than hardware, yeah. became an amazing reality for them. And and for so many of, of the telcos around the world, that's how they built their, I guess, their first attempt at scale. Um, we fast forward a couple of years, um, and it, it kind of morphed into something called CNV or container native virtualized, sorry, uh, container native, um, uh, functions, CNFs. Um, and effectively these CNFs were very similar to the, to the VNFs or the virtual network functions. Um, but they were containers by its very nature. Kubernetes is an orchestrator. It orchestrates containers at great scale, which is exactly why Google built it. So when we think about orchestrating 50,000 virtual machines, that's a ton of infrastructure to do. When we think of orchestrating 50,000 containers, that's not it's yeah. maybe a tenth of it. Um, plus that it was built from the ground up to be an orchestrator. So what we were now able to do, again, was to, to create this, the, the scale in new places like, that our customers had never been able to do it before. Um, if you think about concepts like street poles, uh, every single street pole or every single um, cell phone tower, we can now start to put many more things in because we basically needed a little server and we could stick some software on it. We could activate a whole bunch of new services for our customers, for their yeah, for their customers. Um, so, in a nutshell, what it's given them and all of the telco providers um, is the opportunity to uh, to build sites much quicker, to build more sites at a much lower cost. And to handle so much more scale. And you said, you know, what would generate activity on the network? And you're right. A phone call would do it. A text message would Autonomous do it. Autonomous driving. Like. Anything that needs to communicate needs a network. Yeah. And those networks need places to traverse. Um, for a lot of them, they were done on the mobile network providers because, you know, 5G is such an available technology now. But for a long time, it wasn't. So this was all things running on, on traditional networks. Um, and... Those things were hampered by speed and infrastructure availability. We've now almost freed a lot of that. Where we see that working really, really well is in a business like Starlink. Yeah. Um, so you know we can put satellites into orbit, and all of a sudden they can start serving mobile traffic wherever they need to be. How does that network scale so quickly? Um, so so that that's yeah. that, that's a lot of it in in action. Um. All right. Thank you for that. Sure. Um. Now. Um. As we were saying um, just before we hang with, before this conversation, um, AI has really become the kind of flavor of the year or the decade, probably from now on. And this is no your uh, Red Hat is no um, exception to this. So you now have real AI, um, and so what 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 are your how are you um, using AI in your in your offerings now? Okay, uh, I, I agree with you, uh, Iraq. We, we can't answer, we can't open a browser or a yep. YouTube or an anything, and it's there. Um, and I think a lot of it is is uh, you know almost sometimes creating fake hype about what's going on and how big it is. Um, what I do know, I guess, is is South Africa is definitely not where the US and and EU are, but yep. we never have been. So. Sure. I think I think that's almost a, a benefit for us because we can almost watch where they go wrong before mm. we make any of second our, mover advice. Absolutely, yeah. any of our own mistakes. Um, and and yeah, I mean, you were at the Red Hat Summit earlier this year um, and heard directly from from Matt, our CEO, um, you know, about our move toward AI and enabling um, AI for our customers. 
So certainly we're not going to be uh, you know, an AI company like OpenAI today. Um, we just simply do different things. But what we do, uh, what we do want to do, and have, uh, I, I guess, have have begun building out our offerings on, as you mentioned right there, real AI. So what is inside that? Uh, it's our trusted and loved operating system that our customers are going to continue to use. Um, but we've baked some cool pieces into it. So the first thing is is um, we have, in partnership with IBM, open sourced uh, a, an AI project to the world. Uh, called Instruct Lab. We can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Um, and effectively, yes, in, Instruct Lab. Think about it as as the front end almost. Um, IBM has also built out a bunch of models um, called the Granite family of models, um, and they've open sourced those as well. So, what you get when you deploy this rel now is is basically Instruct Lab. Instruct Lab is baked in, um, as well as 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 I guess it brings down a whole bunch of models, um, and you can go really really quickly. Um, and start to build out your own and profile and train your own your own AI models based on these elements already built into the operating system. Okay, so I'm a say I'm a like a law firm or um yeah, I mean a law firm is not a bad example. Say so, yeah. um I've got my Instruct Lab um, language model, and so how do I? How do you, could you just talk me how you go around? Because I played a, bit, a little bit, a little bit with it at um, at the summit. Yeah. Um, but how would you? How do you see that? How, how? How? What would be the advantages of a company? How would you train it on on something? It, it, it's a good question and something I've done a little bit of of reading about. Um, so if, if we think about the alternatives, I'm a I'm a law firm and I want to find out stuff about a case that I'm working on. Where would I go? Maybe I have a, um, a subscription to a ChatGPT uh, or an Anthropic um, or one of those, and I go and ask it all my questions, um, and I get some answers. That's one way of doing it. The second is I'm a bit more of an advanced law firm, um, and I've built an application, um, and I basically point the application at the API of these um, of these generative platforms, um, and I basically ask it all the questions that I need to know, ask it maybe to generate some new files for me, do my research, all of those kinds of things, um, and, uh, and and I get those results. Um, in a generative way, that's great. The challenge, I guess, that we have, that a lot of customers have is, is um, first of all, the, uh, the data can be biased um, because that's not an owned model. You don't know where it comes from. Exactly. Um, and... Uh, you know, a lot of times you mentioned it as well around the hallucinations. There was a funny thing that said if you asked uh, ChatGPT 3.5 uh, a question and then you asked ChatGPT 4 a question, it would give you completely different answers, even though they were effectively trained on the same data. Mm. Um, so for a law, a law firm that, 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 number one, is not an AI uh, company um, and generally cannot afford to be wrong, yeah. um, there are, I guess, other ways of doing it. Um, but there are people like Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook um, with their Llama series of models um, who went a, a little bit further to to say, I'll give you these open use models now. Um, but again, um, you can use them, but within commercial limits, mm. um, and they cannot be used for anything to make any kind of money. And the problem that Red Hat saw was that although these models have been trained on this data, which a lot of people didn't have access to, if false stuff came back um, or uh, people wanted to contribute back to the model, there simply was no way to do it. Um, so you can't say to the model, no, you're wrong, this is right. Yeah, uh, but they're know, black box. Exactly. Yeah. So they serve a lot of purposes and, and I may, you know, m maybe oversimplifying it, but effectively in Lab, think about it as a front end, um, you know, for, for building chatbots. Um, and this would, would happen inside of your business, inside of your company. Um, and what do these what do what do uh, what do chatbots need? Um, we need data, right? Um, and data, the clean data that we want, correct? The specifically that we've prepared for it, a hundred percent. So, yeah. uh, with the with the combination of of Instruct Lab uh, and the Granite series of models that comes from IBM, either in small language or large language models, um, all of that can be cobbled together to give you, I guess, the creation of 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 your own GPT type service inside of your business where you can now point it to data 
let it ingest it and always be in control of the source of that data um, and then I guess the distribution of the answers of that data. There's a there's a kind of a saying that I've seen more than once to say that, you know, everything that you ask these publicly available GPTs, um, you know, you are effectively training them. Yeah. Um, well, you're the product. Or, absolutely. Yeah. So don't expose anything out there. Yeah. Um, where inside of this, especially for, for data sensitive companies, um, this is really the first place to go, um, you know, to, uh, to start to build it out. The second challenge that, 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 REL AI with Instruct Lab aims to, to, to fix is that um, pre-training and training models can be quite complicated, especially if you choose to bring down all the components and build it out yourself. So a large part of it is 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 almost taken care of for you. Um, there's a there's it, it's a lot more of a simplified process um, to uh, I guess in, ingest multiple forms of data and to start to get out usable results. Well, I mean, I even I did it, and I mean, I trained it. I trained the model on uh, from a Wikipedia page on um, the gaps in the U.S. interstate highway system. So, um, if anyone's uh, interested in that, you've got me to thank for that. Absolutely, um, I'd love to see it. <laughs> um, all right, so that's excellent. I mean, and I don't think that kind of um, um, use case can be. Uh, under em- emphasized about how important that is and how powerful it is for a company. Um, but wh- what are you seeing in in terms of t- t- local take up of that? I mean, are people starting to play around with it? Or so we definitely see a lot of playing around. Um, we, we've had some early conversations, um, and one thing that that we're realizing that Red Hat is realizing is operationalizing AI is hard. Um, you know, it's it, it's great to play around with it. I, uh, I I get it to do a whole bunch of stuff for me. I'm sure you do the same. Um, and it, it not really actually. Not, I, I I don't use it for writing. No, not for writing. Yeah, but uh, like formatting. Um, yeah, yeah. And search AI search engines. Ab- search engines. Yeah. absolutely. Um, getting ideas. Um, you know, for for uh, um, you know, f- for um, uh, for like presentations. Looking at 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 sort of helping me find research. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and a lot of people are doing it, but inside of the organization, the same thing that's 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 choking them up around the modernizing of the core systems is choking them up around how do we operationalize AI, um, and that's really our big focus at Red Hat is to uh, is to enable and support our customers to operationalize this AI. Um, one of the things that does ship inside of the box of REL AI um, from Red Hat is is a full indemnification of uh, data produced with our model usage. Um, so a lot of these open source models um, that you can go and get, uh, yeah, the, whatever data uh, you know they were trained on, whether right or wrong, um, there is no indemnity for using that. Yeah. So again, for our, for our, I, I guess, all of our customers, but for any of those those sensitive customers that would need to make sure that everything is uh, is 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 correct um, and true, there it is. Um, but we also see some early movers, as they always are. You know, yeah, yeah. the the early early adopters, um, and uh, we've seen a few of them. Uh, there, I was at, at a conference the other day. I think Investec spoke about uh, their GPT that they've created internally. Um, there are quite a few other customers that are doing it, um, and uh, it, it 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 is definitely bringing great results. Um, I think it's going to be up to what are the use cases, and and you know what is the I guess what is the the uh, the value of integrating them, um, but yeah, South Africa is generally a little bit behind in the in the bigger corporate and and uh, government world, so uh, we 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 watch this quite excitedly. And I mean, you always hear um, that that AI is going to is coming for your job, um, although or, or, or people kind of sugarcoat it and say. You know that the, the people will be freed up to do more kind of higher level tasks or something more creative, which I think is not true. If you can get someone out the door, save that salary, people are going to take it. But I mean, do you think that's true, or or, 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 or is there any opportunity for AI to create any employment? Which I, is our big problem here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, before I answer that, I found this, and I I wanted to. 
to to uh, to repeat it because it really just just struck the right chord. It, and it says people are worried that AI is going to take their job. No, someone who understands AI is going to take their job. Yeah, and that's from Scott Galloway, a professor at NYU. Yeah, yeah. I uh, listened to his podcast. I used to I used to listen to his podcast. Yes, yeah. yeah. And it, it it really kind of struck it because uh, so many things, so many uh, uh, conferences that I've been at or or things that I've watched where this this becomes a, a front and center issue. Um, yeah, absolutely. It AI services and systems inside of companies are going to uh, to replace jobs. Um, this is not the first time this has happened, though. You know, at, sure. I guess at every advent of of some technological breakthrough, like the motor car and the, the printing press and the internet, things changed. I guess it 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 really is how we start to look at work differently and what we can repurpose these people to do. Um, I think in Africa. Or in South Africa, if we could look at it there, um, I I, th- I think it it opens up, uh, you know, whole new uh, uh, avenues for people, um, you know, to 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 start to a build businesses here, but potentially, um, you know, South Africa is one of the biggest uh, gig economies in the world, um, and uh, as I learned recently, what a gig economy is, and that's that's people doing short contract work overseas, um, and we they cheapish labor because our mm. cost of living is not that high but really for a lot of those people who are working all over the place um it 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 adds a whole new customer base that they can go and talk to um about what kind of work they could do that's great because those kind of people are already working um what what would it bring and, and what kind of jobs could it create um and some some really interesting ones that i found so the first was was around uh you know i guess we have a lot of uh, of students finishing varsity, not able to get jobs. Um, entrepreneurship is pretty high in South Africa. And now one or two or three or five people can get together with an idea um, and go and use one of these uh, um, generative AI services to create a website for them, uh, add a shopping cart system to it, and maybe a payment provider in a Yoko type service. And two or three days later, they're trading on the internet. Um, of course, they'd need product to do that. But yeah. That could be a you know a very challenging thing for some of these young entrepreneurs. Like, how do I get myself on the internet? Yeah. And when I'm there, how do I get a shopping cart service to run? Mm. And then how do I take money from people? Yeah, it's lowering the barrier. Absolutely. So, so I think for for a lot of new young guys coming out of university and girls, um, there's 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 definitely that. From an inside the business perspective, um, you know, everybody says, well, you know, everything's going to be replaced. Um, I think a lot of things are going to be supported. For example, um, you know, the amount of time that, that we sit sometimes trying to talk to customer service people. Um, and when we do get hold of them and you ask them a question and then they go off to look for our information and you've got to authenticate 15 times, um, having a, you know, a generative system right there um, that has maybe even already identified us and can give them supporting information yeah. could make that call a lot shorter. Um, and that's been trained on all our information. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and think about that, you know, in, in all the contexts of medical aids and 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 uh and banking services etc cetera, etc cetera. the government as well how how amazing that could be so i th- i think there is there is uh, um there is work for people to create those services inside of those organizations and those are not going to be created by ai themselves yeah. so these kinds of 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 scientists and engineers that can build <clears throat> these these services are definitely going to have jobs um one more that was really interesting to me, uh, two others, but 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 one that really struck out is is there's quite a new bunch of um, of AI ethicists, um, and these are people that continuously think of them as the new compliance people that continuously assess data that these models are trained on and get reports about it and make sure that anything being generated by this business still has the ethics that the business you know was created on, mm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the training looks like for that, but. That's definitely a, a a new route um of of stuff um, but yeah it it it's super interesting that all these new kinds of roles will will start to become available um and yeah i I wouldn't say it will it will take as many jobs as it will create, yeah, yeah, and the people who cook and um <clears throat> do stone masonry and physical work fish i mean they can't be replaced can't yeah. Yeah, they are. And the other thing uh, that uh, one thing that, that that was interesting to me is is this concept of a citizen developer. Mm. Um, and if we look at, I guess, the history of 
of computer language and computer programming as we started off in the 40s with with machine code um, and went all the way through um, the language of these of these GPTs and this AI is English. Um, so these systems, these citizen developers are going to be, um, you know, I guess become prompt experts, mm. um, and the, their talents and qualities are going to lie in, in how well they can generate prompts to get the information that they need out of these AI systems. Um, and I see already a lot of big hyperscaler businesses, big AI businesses have already got certifications around becoming prompt engineers. Um, but this is really a you know a completely new field that that never existed before, so I think it's it's going to be about eyes wide open. Um, I don't think it's it's the silver bullet to solve our entire job crisis, but I think it can certainly start to help uh, at least some of the parts of the of of our job market that haven't been truly satisfied yet. Mm. Well, that sounds that sounds very encouraging because that's it is I think it's the biggest problem we possibly face in in South Africa. Yep. Um, well. Thanks very much, Bruce. And just before we go, um, I wonder if you've got any suggestions about any podcasts that you're listening to at the moment. Sure. Um, so, so one of them that I'm loving at the moment uh, is a podcast called Acquired. Um, and it's basically uh, two guys, ex-tech guys, um, that fell in love with doing research on on big businesses um, and tell these long, very in-depth stories about how these businesses started and what they went through. Especially interesting was the one around Microsoft, uh, really starting at Bill Gates' childhood and taking it all the way through. Wow. And we lived through so much of that, you yeah. know, with with the, the the advent of the internet, Windows ninety five, you know, the web browsers. Um, yeah, I still so, didn't buy any shares though back then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so so I, I I've really enjoyed that. Um, I listened to one called the Cloudcast, um, which is uh, co chaired by one of our Red Hatters, a guy called Brian Gracely. Um, what I love about it is it's 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 all the cloud stuff. It's not any one thing they talk about. I mean, at the moment and, and on the topic of what we've spoken about, um, an interview this week with a guy that basically consults to the world's data centers um, and cloud providers about how to build data centers for AI. Because as you know, uh, putting all of these GPUs into a server generates a much bigger pool of electricity. Yeah, much more heat. It's, we're going to run out of electricity. After Absolutely. Yeah. And that's that's almost the Achilles heel of, of how far we can go with it. Yeah. Um, and he, he was saying that, that, you know, the Middle East is so power rich at the moment that that could be the next target area for, um, you know, for some of these data AI data centers. Um, but, you know, different things that you need to think about. How to do, you know, security. How to do ethics and compliance around it. So the Cloudcast is, is, is really, really good fun um and something for a bit of a laugh uh conan o'brien needs a friend <laughs> if you ever were a, a conan o'brien fan it didn't happen that much but he interviewed some really really interesting guests people like uh arnold schwarzenegger and um um who else bill clinton okay. um and uh, yeah it's it's just interesting and it's a little bit of fun outside of 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 always listening to tech Thanks very much, Bruce. Appreciate your time. Sure, thanks. Thank you.